Okay, it's time for some review. Today we are covering topic three, reproduction and growth. So let's get right to it. First, reproduction is vital, that means super important, for the survival of a species. An individual like me and like you, we can survive without reproducing, but a species cannot. So there must be reproduction of individuals in order for a species to survive. So let's cover lesson one, the patterns of reproduction. Here's a quick overview. We have the difference between asexual and sexual reproduction. So asexual reproduction, let's talk about its unique features. First, one parent. Second, the offspring are identical. Third, usually it's found in less developed organisms, so more simple organisms. Fourth, it happens faster, way faster. And lastly, there is no mate needed for asexual reproduction. So some examples of asexual reproduction include cloning, include taking a cutting from a plant and it grows into a new plant, it includes budding from a hydra where the new organism literally grows off the side of the parent, falls off and becomes a new organism. It's binary fission, which is how bacteria uh, reproduce. Okay, lots of examples of asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction. All right, two parents, the offspring are unique, so genetic variability, huge, huge, big deal, okay? That is a huge advantage. Um, sexual reproduction have, occurs in typically more complex organisms. It takes more time, and part of that is related to the need to require a mate. In the middle are the things that are the same between them. They both produce offspring, they both require living cells, and they both have DNA to carry the genetic information. Okay, now here is a whole lot of information. So let's look at what we have here. So we have a gene. A gene is a sequence of DNA, right? And a gene can either uh, be a dominant, have a dominant allele or a recessive allele. So a dominant allele is always expressed. It's the boss, it's dominant, always expressed. Recessive allele is, can be hidden. It needs two copies to be expressed. So I could have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, but the dominant allele takes over and hides the recessive allele. So in order for this recessive allele to show up, I would need two copies of it. Now a gene codes for a protein. A protein is a string of amino acids, okay? So a gene, which is a sequence of DNA, codes for a protein. And the protein results in the expression of a trait. And we have two kinds of traits. We have inherited traits and we have acquired traits. So inherited traits, that's the ones that come directly from your DNA, okay? And they're passed to your offspring. So like eye color and hair color and your height and whether you have dimples or a widow's peak, can roll your tongue, all kinds of things, all right? but some traits are acquired and those you get from experience throughout your life and those cannot be passed to your offspring. So things like scars and whether you go tanning or get a tattoo or change your hairstyle. But interesting, it, inherited traits can be influenced by the environment, okay? So for example, I have the hair color I have, but if I go into the sun a lot, my hair color could get lighter due to the sun. That's the environment impacting my genetics. Okay, so the environment can have an impact on how our inherited traits are expressed. All right, so now we're going to cover a few questions that some students actually struggled with when we were doing um, our review. So a dominant allele is always expressed, while a recessive allele is only expressed if there are two copies. And sometimes the expression of an allele is blended. So that's called incomplete dominance. So you have, uh, for example, a white cow and a black cow, and they mate, and the offspring is gray, blended, okay? And sometimes both alleles are expressed, and that's called co-dominance. So that would be a black cow and a white cow mate, and you have a cow with both black and white colors. So here's an example with flowers. You have a red flower and a white flower. If they're mated and they get pink flowers, that would be incomplete dominance. If they're mated and you have red and white, that would be co-dominance. The process of fertilization is when the sperm and the egg 
join to form a new organism called the zygote. The zygote is really a fertilized egg and it will develop first into an embryo and in a human then a fetus um, before it is born. What can influence gene expression? This I already talked about a little bit, but it is the environment. Okay, so an Arctic fox, um, it is lighter, um, is whiter in the colder months when there's snow around, and then um, a different color um, during different seasons to blend in more with the environment then. Uh, the Himalayan rabbit um, experiment has to do with shaving or removing a patch of fur from a Himalayan rabbit putting an ice pack in that area, and what happens is the fur in that area actually grows back black, which is a response um, to colder temperatures. So here you can see the relationship between the size of the animal and how long it takes for the offspring to develop. So gestation period is how long the um, fetus develops inside the mother's um, uterus, okay, getting um, its nutrients through the placenta. So you could see the small animals like a hamster and a gerbil have very low gestation ranges. Those are less than a month, okay? Whereas a red fox, um, that's more than a month, and then a leopard, that is um, approaching three months, okay? Just around three months. So, and then humans, it's 40 weeks, although technically usually we say nine months, right? So as the size of the organism increases, the gestation time also increases. Now let's look at plant structures for reproduction. So we have two major categories of plants. We have gymnosperms and we have angiosperms. Gymnosperms have cones. Jim likes cones, right? The seeds are protected, are unprotected, so they're naked. And usually they have deep roots, all right? And gymnosperms use wind. So think about pine trees blowing in the wind, okay? They require wind for pollination. Okay, so there are male cones and there are female cones. The male cones make the pollen and the wind blows the pollen to the female cones and the female cones have sticky sap on them to catch the pollen, all right? And then we have angiosperms and Angie, she likes flowers, all right? And there are, um, so they have fruit that is um, developed from an ovary. So the ovary becomes fruit and has the seeds inside. And angiosperms rely on pollinators, um, animals, to transfer the pollen from one plant to the next. So the pistil is the female reproductive structure on a flower, and it includes the stigma at the top, that sticky, the sticky stigma, the style, and then the ovary at the bottom, and the ovary is going to become the fruit, and then the ovules inside, and they will become the seeds. And then you have the male part of the flower, which is the stamen, and includes the anther that has like the yellowish kind of colored pollen on the top attached to a filament, okay? And what has to happen is the pollen from the anther has to be brought to the stigma on another flower. Usually plants cross-pollinate, which means the pollen from one flower goes to another. But there is, uh, self-fertilization is possible in some plants, so the pollen from one plant goes to the stigma on the same plant. All right, so here's an um, example showing this is a bee being a pollinator, okay, carrying pollen from one flower to another, okay? So you can see, again, the pollen produced on the anther, and bees are one of the biggest pollinators. All right, now what happens when the pollen lands on top of that sticky stigma? Okay, you don't have to remember the names of the cells. What happens is there's a cell in there that creates a tube, a little pollen tube. Okay, then the cells that are in the pollen tube that are needed for fertilization, they're gonna travel down to the ovules and fertilize the ovules and create seeds, all right? And then the whole ovary is going to become the fruit. So. Pollen is plant sperm, okay? So when it's all, it's pollen is plant sperm and the ovary becomes a fruit, okay? That's pretty awesome. All right, angiosperms again, rely on animals for pollination. Okay, gymnosperms, wind. So what's a pollinator, right? That's an animal that helps pollinate the flowers. So here is just another quick overview. I pretty much have covered all of this, so I'm not gonna go through it again, but this question, there were a lot of um, 
issues with, okay? So again, the um, pistil is the female part, the stamen is the male part. All right, so gymnosperms have cones, right? The male cones hold pollen, okay? And the female cones um, have the ovules and the sticky, sticky sap so it can catch the pollen. Okay, uh, animal behaviors for reproduction. So quick overview of this content. So types of mating systems. So some mating systems involve communication like sounds, scents, which are those pheromones, body movements, and then there's also competition. Animals can exhibit aggression and defend their territory. And there are a lot of reproductive strategies, so parental investment. So if parents spend more time caring for their young, they're going to produce fewer offspring because it's too exhausting. A, a parent can't, uh, you know, say a pair of humans uh, cannot logistically care for a hundred offspring at a time. But fish often lay hundreds of eggs because they have less self-care, okay, so less parental care. Cooperative behaviors, so large groups are going to protect and care for the young. They're going to work together, okay? Um, often they protect the young inside. We have internal versus external fertilization. Internal happening inside the female's body, external outside. And then there's migratory behavior. So animals will migrate for food, better climate, and mates, okay? And migratory behavior means going to a new area, but then coming back, okay? It's not just moving, all right, so what are mating systems? Mating systems are those behavior patterns that are related to how animals reproduce. And internal fertilization happens in organisms like birds and mammals and reptiles. The eggs develop inside the female's body. External fertilization occurs mostly in fish, so you see that cloud of sperm, and the eggs develop outside the, the female's body. And then we have factors influencing growth. So we have tropisms. This is the three main tropisms for you to understand are gravity, light, and water. Okay, so a tropism is growth toward or away from a stimulus. Plants will go toward light. That is a positive tropism. Stems will grow away from gravity. That is a negative tropism. Roots will grow toward gravity. That's a positive tropism. And roots will grow toward water. That's a positive tropism. Some plants do respond to touch, like the leaves will fold in, um, and that would be also a tropism. Okay, and plants do respond to seasons. All right. Now, plants usually, although people don't think about it, they have hormones that kind of direct these responses. All right, so the internal factors that affect growth um, include genes, our genetics, the DNA, as well as hormones. And we are not the only species to have hormones. Obviously, um, even plants have them. And then the external conditions that affect growth would be things for plants, like sunlight and nutrients um, in the soil, water, and space. So we can't plant too many plants in the same spot. They won't all grow or at least grow as big as they should. And you can see this fish in the fish bowl, it's limited by the size of its bowl. All right, so let's go over some questions. What is not an example of a stimulus um, that triggers tropisms? That would be oxygen. Remember, gravity, roots grow toward it, stems grow away from it. Light, plants grow toward it. And touch, some plants do respond to touch. What is not an environmental? So environmental condition, something outside of the plant. So chlorophyll is something inside the plant. But sunlight and soil and competition, those are all conditions that could affect the growth of a plant that are external, okay? Now, some additional review. All right, so let's see. We have proteins. Those are amino acid chains. Genes, that's the sequence, the, the code, the DNA. And the trait is the specific characteristic, like hair color or eye color or whether or not you make insulin or melatonin, okay? So protein, amino acids, trait is a specific characteristic, and the genes is your DNA. 
So what's the placenta? Remember, that's the organ that provides oxygen and nutrients to the embryo inside the mother's body. Remember, the mother's blood and the fetus's blood get really, really close, but they never, ever mix. There's no mixing of blood. The bloodstreams get very close in the placenta, and things pass from the mother's blood to the fetus's blood and from the fetus's blood to the mother's blood. There's no mixing of the blood, okay? But the fetus still gets uh, what it needs and it gets rid of its waste. And what is metamorphosis, right? That's a major body change. So it's a frog egg going through a tadpole and developing into a frog. A caterpillar, okay, forming a chrysalis and coming out as a butterfly, a major body change. Okay, so um, there you have it. That's a whole lot of review of topic three. So hopefully this helped and good luck on your test.